For many Greeks, they view this figure as a very, very ancient, ancient wise man, much, much earlier than Moses. And he was later deified by the Egyptians to become a, a god. And this figure had disciples. He established a school of secret philosophy, wrote down his wisdom on secret plates. And when they got around to depicting Jesus, they depicted it in him as the sage, revealing his wisdom piecemeal. Then there's a, an inner circle of 12, and they go inside and they get access to the true meaning of the parable, the mystery of the kingdom of God. The idea of secrecy, mysteries, they loved that. And Christianity has no special claim on that whatsoever. Right. Dionysius, as a child, dies and is ripped apart by evil characters called Titans. That secret story of how Dionysius dies and is reborn then becomes central to the Orphic mysteries. Osiris, Isis, and then Horus as the kind of primal triad. Father, mother, son. Father, mother, son appears in Christian Trinitarian literature. So the Christians are very, very carefully co-opting this theme which is everywhere pervasive in Greek, Roman, and Egyptian. Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And today, returning, is another special guest, Dr. M. David Litwa, who uh, we just had on, what, about a week ago, two weeks ago? We were talking about the Egyptian god who set, who may or may not be a secret deity of the Israelites. So go check that out. Um, also, David Litwa has uh, tons of books. Look them up on Amazon, go to your local library and ask for them, and you might be able to get them for free. And uh, I'm glad to have you back on. It's great to be here, Neil. Thanks for having me. And today we're switching it up to a different topic, which is also related to Gnosticism, is Hermes and the Corpus Hermeticum of the Hermeticum II, which is your book. And tell people a little bit about the Hermeticum II and what it is. Right. So this is um, Hermetica II. Um, it is a scholarly volume of ancient Greek and Latin sources on the figure of Hermes. This particular bird um, is an ibis. And for the ancient Egyptians, this was the representation of their deity, Thoth. Now it's T H O T H, or Thoth, as it's sometimes said. This bird, interestingly, has become extinct in Egypt, but it's right here with me in Australia. I see this bird all the time. <laughs> wow. um, Thoth was an ancient Egyptian deity associated with learning in general and wisdom, and he was accredited in ancient Egypt very early on with authoring a whole range of literature, which found its way into temple libraries. He was master of all subjects, but he's best known for astrological literature, magic, so-called magical literature, um, literature dealing with medicine and literature dealing with other secret, so-called secret arts, which would include uh, botany, uh, which is the knowledge of plants and metallurgy. And uh, I think I mentioned alchemy which is has to do with uh, the transformation of metals and virtually any kind of secret lore was associated with this figure. And the Greeks knew this figure 
they were familiar with with the name Tote um, or Thoth, uh, but they knew this figure as Hermes. For the Greeks, Hermes was simply a, trans, a way that they translated this Egyptian god into their cultural encyclopedia. Interesting. Uh, the Greek Hermes is uh, it isn't exactly like uh, the Egyptian deity, but they were close enough to make an approximate equalization. And this is this is a technique called um, interpretatio graica, that is Greek interpretation. When Greeks go into an area, they don't try to, you know, learn like an anthropologist, all of the cultural traditions. They translate the cultural traditions of a foreign area into their own terms. Mm. So the Egyptian gods like Zeus is identified with Amon or Amon, and Egyptian gods like uh, Isis are identified with Aphrodite, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so this is one of those cases where when the Greeks are in Egypt, and that begins really, uh, well, it begins very early, but they uh, establish Egypt established Greek cities in Egypt, including Alexandria, after Alexander the Great, who establishes Alexandria uh, before his death in 323. And since that time, there's been this amazing uh, communication and intercommunication between Greek and Egyptian culture, so that the, the Egyptian Hermes, just to be clear, is Tot, and sometimes this figure is called Hermes thrice great, Hermes three times great. So you have to imagine this figure for Egyptians as a deity, but for many Greeks, they they came to view this figure as a very, very ancient, ancient wise man, much, much earlier than Moses obviously much, much, much earlier than Jesus. He was way back in antiquity, wow. and he was later deified by the Egyptians to become a, a god. So that's a little bit of difference in, in, in interpretation. And this figure had disciples, one of them being his son named Tot, the other named uh, Imhotep, uh, whom the Greeks translated as Asclepius. Oh, wow. And he had other disciples like Saturn and uh, the Agathos Daimon, who is the, the good demon. And, oh, wow. cool. and he, he, he established a school of secret philosophy and wrote down his wisdom um, in, on secret plates, sort of like the gold plates of, of Joseph Smith. And these were buried and these were later discovered. And a whole uh, sort of not a secret society, but what we think happened in the around the time of Christianity was that small circles or groups who were promoting hermetic wisdom, sometimes these figures are called hermetists, were also uh, involved in also in places like Egypt and Alexandria, possibly elsewhere. And they were writing hermetic books. And these hermetic books were written in Greek. And some of them were translated into, into Latin. And these are the very, very ancient sources translated here. Interesting. So that's interesting. You said a lot there that's mind-blowing about the history behind this deity. It goes back all the way to before the Greeks settled in or I shouldn't say settled, took over Egypt, basically. Um, well, took them from the Persians, I should say. It's not like they were like they were already taken over by someone else at the time. Anyways, right. <laughs> long story short, uh, this Hermes character, and you mentioned that he was deified. Um, is this so? Because I always wonder if this was a real person or not, or if they, or if, they were, if this is like a composite character. And the other thing I want to ask about is you said he left back tablets. Is this have anything to do with the emerald tablet that I hear about that was found in Heliopolis, I think, by Alexander the Great? 
Correct me if I'm wrong. But. Well, not Alexander the Great, but the Emerald Tablet, which I translate in the book, is a source attributed to Hermes. And it's one of those really secret, spooky sources. Really good, um, too. It's written really well. Yes, it has this kind of numinous aura and is very, very fun to read. That is not not as ancient as most of the other hermetic material that I translate in the volume, but it is still it is still ancient. Um, and so these these tablets were typically thought to be written in ancient hieroglyphics and deposited in uh, secret temples. And so this was a story that Egyptian priests told. And this was the social meaning of this is that Egyptian priests who were experts in hermetic lore got to claim a kind of social power or social capital by saying that they alone had access to these tablets and other materials. So that the knowledge, the secret wisdom was specifically for these Egyptian priests who posed as experts of literate experts and freelance, uh, well, not freelance, but as, a, as official experts of hermetic lore. Later, and this is following the theory of uh, Christian H. Bull, who's got a great book on the Hermetica published not too long ago, these priests in the Roman period began to lose power. And so their official position was lost but they became freelance experts, also propounding their knowledge of hermetic lore and going about forming probably small circles of disciples and generally posing as religious experts in antiquity, right exactly during the time when Christianity is growing in Egypt. Wow, and that's fascinating because the uh, the, the way it's written, and I guess the structure of how these like cults, I guess you would call them, are 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 structured, feels very Christian like. It, it feels like there's like this like patriarchal like Christian unity going on. I guess I don't know if that makes sense. But um, the question, and as I'm reading the text, there's a lot of things that I read that stick out to me. Like that sounds kind of Christiany. And I'll give you an example, and you can um elaborate on this. Uh, it talks about the secrecy of these parables. We can't tell them this. This, If we tell them this, they won't understand. We can only give them on the surface. But on the deeper level, they, this is all secret knowledge that the, the masses can't know except for us. Do you think that has influence on some of the parables in the in the Christian Bible? As in Jesus saying, I only give you these parables because if I told you straight up, you wouldn't understand? Definitely. The way I view that, the influence is not one-to-one. -one. It's not like Hermes and Hermet Hermetis Hermeticism is affecting Christianity or that Christianity is affecting Hermeticism. It's more of they belong to a general culture. Both religious movements belong to a general culture in which secrecy and secrecy motifs gains social capital. So those freelance religious experts who come into an ancient city and are able to say, guess what, everybody, I have some secret teaching from a sage very, very long ago, and it's just been revealed to moi, you know, <laughs> and this sort of generates a lot of interest because it's like, oh, okay, well, there you go. Um, this this is really old stuff and a really cool stuff, and it's just been revealed. And this guy, or on occasion, this gal, wants to reveal it mm -hmm. and has found these secret books or secret tablets or whatnot and has the wisdom to decipher the letters. And bada bing, bada boom. Wow, that's a lot of social capital accrued immediately off the bat if 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 these freelance religious experts are e exposing secrets and of course when they expose the secrets they 
expose them after a ceremony of initiation. So in this kind of religious formation, the teacher tells you, I've got some basic teaching for like the outsiders, and then I've got the advanced stuff for the insiders. And this is a very common structure of how religious lore was communicated in antiquity. And to some degree today, if you want access to the advanced religious lore, you've got to go through some kind of initiation. Now, for Christians, that would be a baptism, baptism right. which gives you access to a sacred meal, a.k.a. the Eucharist. For Hermes, wow. this might involve other other things. And an initiation could be anything. It's sort of like a, a fraternity sort of uh, kind of a thing uh, when you when you think of initiation. Sometimes they involve rituals that are painful. Sometimes they involve going into a dark room and hearing a story, holding up a light, starting a fire, jumping over a fire. It could be anything, and anything can be involved in your initiation. And after your initiation is complete, you become a full member of the community. And then you get more and more access to the secret information, which is revealed piecemeal by the teacher. So when the Christians get around to writing up the stories of Jesus, this pattern of religious lore and instruction mm -hmm. is so built into their minds because it's so common. You find it everywhere in the Greek mysteries of Eleusis, of Samothrace. Uh, you find it in even mystery cults dealing with the imperial rulers. I believe Mithra find, has an like initiation thing too. Exactly. You find it in the Mithras cult. So any, any religious formation can make use of this structure. And Christianity also made use of this structure. And when they got around to depicting Jesus in the Gospels, which are fairly late products, they depicted it in him as, at least partially, as a sage revealing his wisdom piecemeal and revealing more to insiders. So to outsiders, he gives children's stories and funny anecdotes. They don't really understand. They go away. Some of them who are interested want to keep on. Then there's a, an inner circle of 12, and they go inside and they get access to the true meaning of the parable, the mystery of the kingdom of God. So the Christians are very, very carefully co-opting this theme, which is everywhere pervasive in Greek, Roman, and Egyptian religion. Well put. And um, I also think it's interesting. I, I couldn't help but to think of the Nag Hammadi's text, and which is also from Egypt. So it, it makes sense to me that there would be influences of Hermeticism. And in particular, I'm thinking of the story of Jesus talking to the disciples and asking them who they think he is. And they're all answering, I think you're the Messiah. I think you're the son of man. I think you're son of God, whatever. And then finally it gets to... I think it was like Mary, I think, Mary Magdalene or something. It was like Peter or Mary. I can't remember. Maybe, maybe you know this. But one of them says, if I said who you are, everybody would kill me. And I guess the person, I guess it's like insi insinuating that he's God himself. And like that's like a no-no, which is interesting because it reminds me of this like secret wisdom thing that you see in the, in the Hermetica. Yes, you're referring to the Gospel of Thomas uh, saying 13, where Thomas is told three secret words from Jesus, and the oh, other yeah. disciples are jealous, yeah, yeah, yeah. and they want Thomas to, to reveal to them what the three secret words are. And Thomas says, if I did so, you would take up stones and stone me, and then fire would come out of the stones and burn you alive. Whoa. So, <laughs> <laughs> the the idea of secrecy is very, very strongly rooted in Christianity, but it's also one of the most common aspects of Greek and Roman and Egyptian religions at right. the time. They loved mysteries. They loved that. And, and so that 
that is not common. Christianity has no special claim on that whatsoever. Right. That's 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 a good way to put it. Um, so and then so my next question is about compare because a lot of people compare. First of all, let me say this: as you get through the text deeper and deeper, it starts off it's Hermes and Tot, father and son. Which, by the way, that feels uh, obviously I'm a I'm looking at it with future looking back. So obviously I see Christianity before it. So I have to like go through Christianity to read this text, obviously. So I see father and son and I'm immediately thinking of like the Godhead. I only do it, but the father tells me to do and like the father and the son and the whole. That's what I feel when I'm reading it. Um, I don't know how you feel about that. But the reason why I bring that up is because as you get later on in the text, it progresses into different characters. You get to, gets to, gets into Isis. It gets into Horus, the birth of Horus. And um, it's this, my question is, is there any connection to Jesus and, first of all, Horus? Because that's the one that everyone seems to jump on. It seems to be like, maybe Zeitgeist made that happen. I'm not sure. But also Hermes, because I think Hermes has more going on there. Him being called the word and by a Plutarch in Isis and Osiris. I think there's more going on there than her. But what do you think about those two characters and do they connect to Jesus at all or not or not at all? What do you think? Well, again, you have to look at the big patterns of Greek, Roman and Egyptian religion. And it's very common in these systems to have a uh, apparent deity and a, a child deity. I mean, you see this all, all over Greek mythology as well. Zeus is father of uh, Heracles or Hercules, who then performs labors and then his son is, is fully deified and rises to heaven. Uh, even a more pertinent example is, is Zeus as father of Dionysius, because the Zeus Dionysius pair is very special to Orphic thought. Interesting. And it, in this case, Dionysius, as a child, dies and is ripped apart by evil characters called Titans. And then he is, he only has his beating heart remain. His beating heart is preserved. And then his, from that, his body is put back together. So unlike Humpty Dumpty, he, he does get to be resurrected. And, <laughs> uh, and out of this, out of this comes a, a religion of, of, what you could call, you might call resurrection, but um, our resuscitation. But I think it's probably a resurrection is fine because Dionysus grows up as a deity, as a son of Zeus, despite having died. And so he carries with him the, the mystery of life. And that secret story of how Dionysus dies and is reborn then becomes central to the Orphic mysteries. In the case of, of e Egyptian religious lore, you see this also. Um, Amon or Re, sometimes combined, um, is mm -hmm. a father deity. And you have Hermes, interestingly, being a father deity to Isis in this literature. So there's a father daughter relationship. You obviously have Osiris, Isis, and then Horus as the kind of primal triad, father, mother, son. Right. Father, mother, son appears in Christian Trinitarian literature in Nagamati sources. It's the father, mother, son pattern of the Trinity is very common in Sethian lore or so-called Sethian lore. For instance, in the Apocryphon or Secret Book of John. Jesus is one of the first things Jesus says is, I'm the father, I'm the mother, I'm the son. That early pattern of Trinitarian speculation uh, is, is based on a family model. And so we, we do see, we do see in, in religious lore, and, and I'm, I'm intentionally not calling this religious lore of mythology because that carries uh the most important thing probably for your viewers to know is that ancient people really believe this stuff. And so to yeah. call it mythology 
gives the wrong impression because it wasn't mythology to them. It was just their own religion. <laughs> I, I 100% so I, agree with that. Just as like a, a Christian today wouldn't refer to the Gospels as mythology, right. they would refer to it as history. So I'm, I'm trying to play fair to them. But yes, this pattern of father, son, or father, mother, son, or father, daughter is, or even mother, son, as in the case of Isis and Osiris, your readers are, you sorry, your viewers are probably very familiar with that icon of, of Isis lactating or breastfeeding Horus, yep. which becomes a model for Mary feeding the baby Jesus. And uh, that's extremely well documented. The Christians are, are just sort of re remolding that iconography. So yes, obviously there is, there's an influence, but I think the short answer there and, and something to avoid is, 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 is simplistic sort of genetic connections between one and two things. What, what is important is to understand that there's a whole culture here and, and scores of stories so that one has to, again, really seek to get the big picture. And that takes a lot of study before you're able to say, all right, well, who really could have had an impact on who, when, where, and how? a really good point and so and yeah that I, that's well well put now with hermes though hermes seems to be like some sort of mediator i wonder if there's more going on there as like archetypal wise not one and one like you said but i would say because people like to say horus and jesus have so much in common but i would i don't know if you agree with me i think hermes and jesus probably have more in common what do you think i mean do you do you agree, or do you think it's a little more complicated than that? Just a to, to yes or no to that. Well, they have the basics in common. They're both viewed as deities by those who worship them. They are also both viewed as sages who are in the deep past. Now, obviously, Jesus is much, much, much more recent than than Hermes. But from the perspective of today, Jesus is, you know as far back as, as any modern person would probably care to remember. Right. Um, in, in antiquity, that wasn't the case. In antiquity, Jesus was still, uh, you know, hot off the press. But the idea of there being a sage who has access to more ancient wisdom, because Jesus sort of is, is for Christians, the gateway to a more ancient wisdom, which is mosaic, that is from Moses. So there, there's that type there's that typology of sage. There's that typology of divine sage, deity. There's also the typology of divine sage who reveals secret lore from heaven. And the father, and, too. And the father. And, and Hermes himself uh, ha is, is subordinate to the hermetic creator god. So that's an, also important to remember. So there is a, for, for hermetic, people or hermetists if you will there is a primal deity who is unspeakable and unknowable and in some hermetic texts he is described as a as a creator and that's most famously in the in the Kore Cosmu and then Hermes who may or may not be identical with one of the planets known as Mercury is subordinate to this creator, but then Hermes is is higher on the rank than say Isis because Hermes gives birth to Isis, who then gives birth to Horus, and then the, these traditions are are passed wow. down. That's interesting. I just I didn't know that. I just, I just learned that just now. Um, and so the last thing I want to say, and this this has been awesome. The last thing I just wanted to ask you because you mentioned Mercury, the planet, and you know, you, so you got Mercury, Thoth. Mercury's in Greece, Her, no, Hermes is in Greece, Mercury's in Rome, Thoth in Egypt, and they're sort of equivalents in the, in the sense that they have an archetype in common, and they're all identified as the plant, same planet, I think. But also, I want to go even a step further, the alchemists really love Hermes. He seems to be the god of alchemy later on. And I wonder if they chose the metal to be called Mercury because that is the metal that draws other metals out it seems to be like this mediator metal just like mercury or thoth is a mediator god i wonder if there's any connection there if you've heard of this or am i just 
am I in all the way in left field right now? <laughs> and that's well, how- I mean, I guess the short answer is, and it's really important to confess ignorance when you have it. I'm, I'm not an expert in alchemy per se. So someone else who is a true expert in alchemy might have a better answer for you. But, but basically, yeah, the element mercury uh, is named after the planet and uh, who is also a god. Because right. Mercury is simply the the Latin word for for Hermes. Those gods are are basically seen as one. Um, whether in the naming of that substance Mercury, there was thought to be additional factors playing into that, such as because Hermes is a mer- is a mediator, uh, and the element of Mercury is somehow mediating between metals or drawing them out, as you say. I don't know if there was that kind of philosophical background, uh, so I, I, I just have to confess um, yeah. that that's a that's very fascinating speculation, and right. yeah, you should definitely get an expert on alchemy to give you a fuller answer. It's a good idea. I want to check that out. And then the last thing I, I, I promise is the last one. This just popped in my head because I thought about Her- Herodotus when he talks about Mercury. He says that the I think the Germans or the Gauls or somebody in the north worships Mercury as their head god. And I think a lot of this has caused later historians to identify this Mercury as being Odin. Is this, do you know about about this at all? Or is is this just, because I know Herodotus does say they worship Mercury. And he does say it's their head god. Like that's their big kahuna, like our Zeus, basically. Yeah, definitely. Um... I think so. Just keep in mind, Herodotus is uh, he's he's uh, fifth century, so he's he's very early, and he's going to tell you the information that he knows. Um, he's the and, same guy who's talking about one-eyed men, so we got to keep it keep that with a grain of salt. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, I don't doubt that that he knew of people who might have identified their chief deity as Hermes. That seems perfectly plausible. Who exactly these people were and what exactly they believed, that's another question. Um, And you'd probably need an expert on Norse mythology to talk more about Odin. Um, I mean, it could be, or maybe not, because even the information that Herodotus has, a lot of it is through hearsay, and I don't think he would have had access to information of really far northern European traditions. Um, but that's just my uh, sort of throwaway response. Sure. Again, I have to confess uh, large, largely ignorance on this one, Neil. <laughs> yeah, and I think I think um, I think the reason why it's so easy to draw that comparison is you see Odin with the the wings on his head, and I think mm-hmm. Mercury has those too. So you know. It's so someone like me, I, I always get to doing this kind of stuff, but then that's why I love having you people like you on because I get to, I stay grounded and I don't just go off in, in this space with my own theories. I get to, you got to have scholars. You got it. It's just the way it is. And um, yeah, well, the historical task is you've got to dig, dig deep. It's sort of like you're an archaeologist. And if you're just looking on the top, let's say you're looking at a mound or a big hill of of dirt where you think an ancient city is. And if you're just looking on the top, basically you know nothing about that ancient city. Maybe a couple of things are sticking out like a column or something, or, uh, you know, God knows what, a pole of some sort. But in order to get any knowledge of what's going on in antiquity, you have to dig. And so a lot of what the historical work is, is you're, you're peeling back layer after layer after layer after layer. Because each generation will receive a story and then slightly change it. So, um, yeah. So what 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 you're seeing uh, in in the 21st century might be something entirely different and new. That's not to say what you're seeing is wrong, but it is to say that there has to be uh, there has to be a control a control element. So if we're interested in if we're interested in in antiquity in the ancient world and what really was 
the context for Christianity, then we've got to really stick very, very close to the ancient sources. Good point. Good. And a good point to end on. So let's tell everybody, where can they get the book Hermetica 2? Well, um, so it's published by uh, Cambridge University Press. Um, I understand they will be releasing a soft copy soon. So if you don't want to get the hard copy or if that's too pricey for you, there should be a uh, soft cover coming out. Ooh, nice. There's also the there's also the e-version. And since this book was published in 2018, it's been out circulating for about three years. Chances are, if you're by a major library, you uh, might have get access to it to it that way. Obviously, though, it's on Amazon and every other major platform for buying books. And you might be able to pick up a used copy and, yeah, go from there. Obviously, there's also a lot of stuff just to be wary of on the on the internet uh, and and older editions and and things of that nature. Uh, you know, just be careful in in your in your research. Um, the Hermetica, uh, my volume is called Hermetica Two. There's also simply a Hermetica uh, published in 1992, also by Cambridge University Press. That's by Brian Copenhaber. And that gives a, a, a different set of the ancient sources in a good English translation. So what you want is probably to get ultimately to get both volumes. Um, and what I'm giving, I give a little bit more of an introduction and um, uh, and it's, it's a bit more up to date. But I think both are necessary for really coming to understand the Hermetica. And that's really, it, it. your benefit of doing that is you get access to a religion that was active right when Christianity was going and it was sort of getting oh kick-started. And you get to see super how these things were interacted. Yeah. yeah, it's so compelling. Oh, sorry, I cut you off, go ahead. No, no worries. Uh, so enjoy and uh, formulate those questions and uh if there's more questions i'm happy to come back on uh if if your if your uh, viewers leave a lot of comments and uh yeah happy studying yeah definitely leave some comments and some questions and maybe we can get get you back on to uh answer them and uh you have just attained true gnosis You have just attained true gnosis. The Demiurge has no power over you. Jesus.